What's up everyone, Ashley Noel here. In this video, I'm gonna talk about moving as part of a military PCS, so a permanent change of duty station. And I'm gonna focus mostly on trying to give you some practical, no kidding advice on what you can expect your process to look like, some things that you should do, some things that you shouldn't do. I really do hope that the advice that I give you in this video turns out to be helpful for you because I know that if somebody would have given it to me maybe a few years back, then it probably would have made things a little bit easier for me up until now. So here it is. So on this channel, we talk about military lifestyles generally, and I also give tips on living and working abroad. So if any of those topics interest you, then please consider hitting that like and subscribe button down below. Generally in the Air Force, at least, officers tend to PCS every one to two years. Sometimes if you are in a certain location, you can request to extend for a third year at that same assignment, but that's not the norm. So it's pretty rare that those opportunities are actually given. But I also say that considering your career field, so for instance, if you are an AWACS pilot, then the AWACS is only located at certain bases. So for you, it would be conceivable that you could stay in the same location for a decade, possibly, but for other officers in the Air Force who aren't tied to a specific airframe that is tied to a specific location, we tend to move a lot. This has been my fourth military move so far, and I really can't even sugarcoat it if I'm going to give you an honest perspective. Just dealing with the move itself, all of this stuff behind me, all of the chaos behind me that you really can't see, it gets really old and it's one thing if you get placed in a location that you don't really like because then you can just look at it like ah, i'll just be here one or two years and then i get to leave but it's also really tough to develop any sense of stability in your lifestyle when you're moving that frequently there are two ways that you can do a military move you can pack up everything yourself hire a moving company and have those movers ship your stuff to your next duty location and that's called a diddy move a do-it-yourself move but the other way the more common way the way that i've done it every time is to have the military hire movers for you and those military movers will come to your home pack up your stuff and ship it for you but the thing about the military movers is that if you go that option, they have to pack up your stuff. So even if you try to pre-pack and put things in boxes and close up those boxes, the movers will open up those boxes so that they can take inventory of what's inside and you are not going to be reimbursed for any of those materials that you purchase to pre-pack. Depending on where you're moving from and where you're moving to, it can take about two months for your household goods to actually get to you. So what's gonna end up happening is on your orders, you're gonna be authorized two pieces of luggage and a carry-on bag to be able to take on the plane to travel to your next duty station. So before the movers even come, you need to set aside about two months worth of clothes and necessities to pack in those airplane bags because once your stuff is gone, you're gonna be living out of those two pieces of baggage until your household goods finally get to you. I was actually doing a lot of things in my absence of not making videos. I didn't just go ghost for no reason. Like that, I took some time to get my private pilot's license and it became way too much trying to study, fly, and make videos all on my off time. I just didn't physically have the hours in the day. But part of the reason is because once I shipped my stuff, I, I had nothing. I didn't even have a chair. I was basically just sleeping on my floor in my apartment with some sweats and my travel pillow. And trying to film in that type of scenario would have just looked a little strange, so I didn't even try. If you go the route of having the military movers move you, then once you finally do get your stuff, then you can either have them unpack everything for you, or you can unpack everything yourself. The benefit of having the movers unpack everything for you is that all of the packaging materials, so all of the boxes, anything, the filler materials, they will break all of that stuff down and take it with them. And also they will put together anything that the previous movers took apart. So furniture, for instance, like your bed, 
they will put that back together. The downside of it is that the military movers aren't actually going to help you put anything away. They're just gonna take the contents of those boxes and just sort of dump them in your space. So at least they will try to make neat piles of your stuff, but yeah, they're gonna be dumping your stuff on your floors and on your countertops, and you're just gonna have to deal with it yourself. So your space ends up looking something like this, and doing this, having to deal with this every one to two years, it just becomes a lot. And what also makes it a little bit challenging is that it's not like you're gonna have time off to be able to settle into your new home, to unpack all of this stuff. No, you're just gonna have to do it on the weekends or when you get home from work, you're just gonna have to make time to do it because you're not gonna be given any time to do this otherwise. Things that you should realistically expect without fail every single time that I have moved, my stuff has come back to me either damaged, broken, or just outright missing. When I say damaged, wood tends to have a particularly difficult time with military moves, I've noticed. You'll get chips like this pretty regularly, like these chips to my kitchen table. This happened with this move, and it may not seem like a big deal, but when this sort of thing happens every move, it doesn't take a long time before your stuff just starts to look beat up. One thing that I did this time around is I went to a hardware store and I got some wood putty because I have some pretty big gashes in my sleigh bed from this move. And also I got what looks sort of like crayons that you use on wood to cover up the chipped parts of your, you know, whatever, your table, your dresser, whatever it may be. So that's how I'm gonna try to conceal just how bad the damage actually is to all of my furniture. Broken things, I had a wardrobe in my household goods, and fortunately it was nothing that I really cared about, just extra closet space really, uh, a wardrobe that I bought from Ikea, but that thing arrived to me broke broke. Like there was no way that I could put that thing together, wood glue it back together to make it function as a wardrobe anymore. That thing was just hard broke. So it is now sitting on my curb waiting for the trash collector to come pick it up because there is no life left in that wardrobe. So sometimes your things will just be done. And I guess one silver lining to all of this is that it makes you less materialistic because you're less uh, hmm. you have to accept that your stuff is going to be broken stolen or damaged so it makes you it forces you to care a lot less about stuff now i say that but we all do have some things that we genuinely do really care about like i i think i do pretty well in not being very materialistic and that I care about a lot of stuff, but I do collect designer and niche fragrances. That is, that is just, just a thing that's just like my happy place. And when I was leaving Korea, I had developed a pretty decent collection of designer and niche fragrances. And that was just, that was like my joy. And I remember when the movers came and I, I, I sat there in front of the lead mover and I watched him pack up all of my designer and niche fragrances because I wanted to make sure that he was packing them well enough so that they wouldn't break in the box and he put everything in one box. He was talking to me as he was packing them all up like, oh, this is a really nice one and just, he's just uh, describing how nice the fragrances were because yeah, they, they were. And so I'd say thank you and I was proud of, proud of what I had. And lo and behold, when I got to England, everything came except for that one box. Oh my God, that was, that was heartache. That was, that was heartache. But this is what got me when I went to file a claim for it, because everybody says, when, if, you're, if you're missing your stuff, then file a claim. So here's the thing, when you do a military move, so when the military hires movers to pack up and ship your stuff, you will be given a high value item inventory list. So on this list, you, there's a certain dollar amount that qualifies as a high value item. 
and you list out all of your high value items on that list. And so if something happens to those items and you file a claim for it, you will be given a higher threshold of what you can be reimbursed for those high value items. Okay, so when I was looking at my perfumes, each individual perfume on its own as an item didn't meet the threshold of a high value item. So I didn't list out a laundry list of all of my perfumes on the high value item list. But when I went to file my claim, the Air Force Claim Center told me that, oh, well, as an aggregate, all of these perfumes taken as a collective was a high value item. So you should have listed all of the perfumes as a high value item. I didn't realize that was the definition of item. If we go by that logic, then, okay, all of my weight gear, every, every piece of weight gear, I'm gonna list all of that as high value items because as an aggregate, as a class, yes, all of that is high value, even though the individual items themselves are not. All of these books that I have, I'm gonna list that as a class, high value items because individually, no, but as an aggregate, yes, all of my perfumes as a class. I mean, that's just, it's like, saying that every single box that you have that could potentially be over a certain amount as an aggregate should be listed as a high value item. I didn't think it was right. I thought it was wrong, but uh, yeah, lesson learned. So now moving forward from that, I very liberally list things on that high value items list because I don't know what their standard is, if they're gonna look at actual items or if they're going to look at a whole class of things that you own and call that an item. So lesson learned. But along those lines, any type of electronics like your tablets, your laptops, don't put that in your household goods, put that in your carried luggage valuable jewelry, basically anything that is too important for you for somebody to steal. Don't put that in your household goods. You need to put that in your carried luggage. Also in your carried luggage, that luggage that you're going to be taking on the airplane with you, since you're going to be living out of that luggage for an extended period of time, you need to make sure that your uniforms are in there. And actually this time around, I put my uniforms in my carry-on bag and I strapped my boots to my backpack. And it's a good thing that I did because I had to fly through London Heathrow Airport and they lost both of my big pieces of luggage. So all I had was my carry-on bag. So basically all I had in terms of clothes was my uniforms for a good little while until they finally got those back to me. Another thing, this might be career field specific though. This is something that JAGs or attorneys are really conditioned to do. We always put our service dress in our carry-on bag or our carried luggage, uh, just because as attorneys, it is foreseeable that on short notice, we can appear in court at any given time. But I'm not sure if that's the norm for other career fields, other officers or senior NCOs. I could see that as a potential thing for you in the event that you get called in to be a panel member on a trial, but you'll usually be given some lead time for that. It's usually not gonna happen uh, pretty instantly unless it's something like an administrative discharge board. But anyway, long story short, I know for JAGS, that is another normal thing that we put in our carried luggage or service dress. So. So key takeaways, don't be too attached to your stuff because it will end up broken, damaged, or just outright missing. If you are attached to your stuff, then make sure that you pack it up in your carried luggage and you take it on that airplane with you. And also make sure that you are marking that high value item list liberally. I do hope that all of this was helpful. If it was helpful to you, then please make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. It's completely free to you and it helps me to know that the information that I'm providing is actually useful. Have a great day and I will see you next time.